Spinosaurus is a genus of dinosaur with a truly intriguing history of discovery. First described in 1915 by German paleontologist Ernst Stromer, the massive neural spines of the organism named Spinosaurus aegypticus made it surely one of the most remarkable paleontological discoveries of the early 20th century. Unfortunately, these remains were not to last, as being placed in a museum in Munich, they were destroyed by the Allied Royal Air Force in a bombing raid. Leading up to this tragic event, the remains of the Spinosaurus holotype, among many others, had been stored in the museum for three decades. But with the outbreak of the Second World War, Stromer knew much of the specimens were vulnerable. Stromer tried desperately to convince the museum director to move the priceless remains to safety, knowing that while Munich had been safe thus far, its safety would be short-lived. However, because he had criticised the Nazi regime, the director refused to help, and as an avid follower of the Third Reich, refused to help with his efforts, viewing Stromer's thoughts as defeatist. Stromer's worst fears came on April 24, 1944, where in a bombing raid that damaged 50% of the city, utterly annihilated the museum housing the only known remains of Spinosaurus and many other organisms, leaving Stromer's life's work in literal ashes. In just a few decades of contact with humanity, all of what had been discovered of this animal's remains were annihilated. All of what had been discovered of this animal's remains were gone, essentially becoming extinct a second time, with only Stromer's drawings and descriptions, as well as two known photos, remaining. For decades, Spinosaurus remained an enigma, an unusual, awe-inspiring animal lost to time. And while not entirely forgotten, was an animal now overshadowed by other large, more complete theropods. Thankfully though, this wasn't to last, as near the end of the century in the 1990s, new material was described, notably revealing premaxillar and dentary fragments, a ridged, longitudinal fluted crest from the region between the eyes, a snout including the premaxillae, partial maxillae and partial nasals. But still, even with all these useful remains, nothing could yet reveal the complete outline of this animal without having to use inferences from close relatives, resulting in Spinosaurus taking more of its anatomy from other Spinosaurids than itself to get a true glimpse of its appearance. Things changed in 2014, however, when a paper published by Nazar Ibrahim and colleagues described new remains from a subadult animal labelled as the neotype most notable for its short hind limbs, which suggested that Spinosaurus may have been a quadrupedal. Further revisions have revealed the claws to be more suited for catching prey than walking, although anatomical limitations had already invalidated this posture beforehand, as well as the centre of mass being concentrated near the hips. While greatly increasing our knowledge of the animal and reaffirming their aquatic tendencies, debate and further mystery followed, while having many adaptations for swimming, the lack of an effective propulsion method, among other critiques, led some paleontologists to assume that Spinosaurus would have been better off hunting its aquatic prey from the shores of its habitat, most similar to a grizzly bear or heron. Therefore, locomotion in the water was a major point of contention, as no unambiguous evidence for a plausible mode of propulsion had yet been presented until very recently. Others also assumed that the remains may have come from different specimens, meaning the neotype was a chimera, or even a hoax, and that the skeleton was too strange to be natural. The validity of these claims are doubtful, as histological bone analyses don't show differences between the various parts, and there is no evidence to support the claims. Debate on this neotype would continue to carry on, and seeking to put the controversy to rest, Dr. Ibrahim and his colleagues returned to the Moroccan Spinosaurus site to check for more remains in September of 2018. Time was however of the essence, as he had heard from local contacts that commercial fossil diggers were tunnelling into nearby hills for bones. Due to this, Ibrahim could not risk letting the rest of what he believed to be the world's only known Spinosaurus skeleton to vanish into collector's curio cabinets, which once there, would be near impossible to re-find. All the new remains were found through rigorous documented excavations, carried out by a team of geologists and paleontologists, and could therefore not be accused of obtaining bones through scattered bones collected by amateur collectors. The remains of the neotype were questioned on their authenticity by critics over the original fossils, since those remains reached paleontologists indirectly, and were excavated by a local finder. Through this second excavation, all doubts on the validity of the remains were therefore rendered obsolete, and while a brutal excavation to begin with, with their only jackhammer breaking within minutes, 
and with several team members being hospitalised once they returned home. The promise of discovery kept them going, and they started to find tail vertebra after tail vertebra. By the end of the dig season alone, the dig team had uncovered more than 30 caudal vertebrae, and pieces of the feet were collected and archived in a lab in Casablanca. Crucially, some of the vertebrae neatly match up with illustrations of the more fragmentary Spinosaurus tail vertebrae that Stromer published in 1934, bolstering the case that Spinosaurus lived across Cretaceous North Africa, from Morocco to Egypt. In addition, Ibrahim and his team didn't find any duplicate bones at the Moroccan site, a clear sign that the fossils belonged to just one individual, belonging to the already described 2040 neotype which is an extremely unusual occurrence in the Chemchem beds, and in turn, unambiguously confirming the tail to belong to Spinosaurus. When the fruits of all the labour by the team were laid out, it took five tables to support the reconstructed tail's full length, and to the shock of the team, the appendage resembled a giant bony paddle, revealing that Spinosaurus was even more unusual than what we could have possibly imagined. Before this discovery, the tail of Spinosaurus was unknown, having instead to be reconstructed based off of relatives like Baryonyx or Suchomimus, having a rather typical theropod tail to help support the animal's balance. This newly described tail, on the other hand, displays extraordinary adaptations to aquatic propulsion, and from what has been displayed, was clearly indicative for use in an aquatic environment, as the paper suggests. The vertebrae have incredibly tall neural spines, as well as extended chevrons underneath. The paper goes on to suggest that this tail would have been utilised to effectively propel the animal through the water, in a similar way to living crocodilians or newts. The bones of the tail itself are quite unique, in that unlike other theropods, they are not at all stiffened. Tetanurae, the group Spinosaurus belongs to, possess stiffened tails, in which the degree of overlap in articulation between pre- and post zygophophyses of the articular processes projections of the vertebra that are designed to fit within adjacent vertebrae increases along the caudal series, greatly diminishing the range of motion between individual vertebrae, and therefore maintaining a rigid tail critical in keeping the animals balanced. By contrast, in Spinosaurus, the pre- and post zygophophyses are much further reduced than in other tetanurans, and in the middle and distal portions of the tail not only do not overlap, but almost disappear. This allows the caudal region considerable flexibility, especially with regard to lateral movements, meaning that this large, flexible fin-like tail was capable of extensive lateral exertion. The tail is therefore most similar to that of a newt or crocodilian as previously mentioned, although there are some notable differences. The spines on the vertebrae of these remains reveal quite an interesting tail, as the transverse processes, depending on the width apart from one another, corresponds to how much musculature the tail would have attached, which in the case of Spinosaurus were especially wide at the base of the tail, sticking out at a near 90 degree angle, which combined with the tall neural spines and the chevrons on the underside would have made a robustly muscled base to the tail. They remain like this until the 11th or 12th vertebra, at which point the sideways transverse processes continue to get smaller until they disappear by the 18th vertebra. After this point in the tail, the neural spines are no longer broad at the side, becoming incredibly thin with a bulbous point at the top of the vertebra. The shrinking of the transverse processes means that the muscle blocks of the tail also shrink, with the middle of the tail being oval-shaped and the end being a pill-shaped in cross-section, meaning that the more distal parts of the tail are weaker than the proximal parts, meaning that the tail gets thinner as you move from the base to the end. This is particularly interesting, as crocodilian vertebrae, a group of animals that Spinosaurus is often compared to based on ecology and similar anatomy, are mostly compared due to the hypothesised form of locomotion that is shared between the two, that is moving the tail from side to side in a flexible manner. The vertebrae of these animals are however quite different, in that it has been noted that crocodilian and Spinosaurus caudal vertebrae are distinct. Crocodile tails have transverse processes that continue along the entire tail length, allowing an ample amount of muscles to be attached to aid in the sideways undulation of the tail. This means that crocodilian tails are powered equally along the entire length, whereas the tail of Spinosaurus has the most strength near its base. To gain a better understanding of how effective the tail would have been in aquatic locomotion, Ibrahim and his team conducted a series of experiments, utilising pliable plastic to reconstruct the tails of several different animals, to compare their respective effectiveness. 
and to find out where Spinosaurus lied when compared to other animals in swimming potential. The tail of Spinosaurus was compared to Coelophysis, Allosaurus, a Nile crocodile and a crested newt, as well as a rectangle, with the models being attached to a robotic controller and placed in a water flume fitted with sensors and pistons to track the movements of the tails and the forces that they impart as they move through the water. The results from the experiment show that the Spinosaurus tail was capable of generating more than 8 times the thrust of the tails from the other theropods, and at 2.6 times the efficiency. While not as efficient as the crocodile and newt tails, the tail of Spinosaurus still had a positive benefit for aquatic propulsion relative to other theropods, with the tail morphology also increasing the lateral stability of the body in the water reducing the tendency to roll while floating, effectively disregarding a previous paper that suggested that their stability in water was questionable at best. As is often with Spinosaurus, there has been some debate, this time directed to the tail, and how useful it actually would have been for aquatic propulsion. The tail of Spinosaurus, as previously mentioned, is quite similar to crocodiles, and as such, has been scrutinised by some on how effective it would have been given its differences. Paleontologist Mark Witten noted that as well as the vertebrae becoming more and more delicate as the tail advances posteriorly, the reclined neural spines start to overhang, which he suggests to have limited the flexibility of the structure. The spines bend downwards and slightly down, which means that by the tip, the vertebrae start to overhang the ones after them, and for a tail to be very flexible in the case of crocodilians, they cannot have any bone in the way which is the case in the latter, as all of the spines point up at the same angle and are also tightly packed together, quite different compared to Spinosaurus. As the Spinosaurus tail is not as efficient compared to crocodilians, some have suggested that Spinosaurus would have been more of an ambushed predator than compared to crocodiles due to this inferred limited flexibility. Although, as I'll get into, while they could have been more inclined to ambushing, the spines of its tail were likely not the reason for this. The statement by Mark Witten on the inflexibility of the tail has since been relaxed, as the statement doesn't take into account the musculature that would have been present in life, deforming the neural spines and holding them in place to match the arc of the tail while swimming, not to mention that the bone itself would have had the potential to bend as well. The suggestion of the spines being too thin and fragile can also be reasoned with, as there are animals that do possess similar anatomy, that's being a fish, with active swimming fish like marling possessing several different arrangements of vertebrae in their tails, some of which have spines overlapping several vertebrae in some cases, and yet still utilise their tails as the main form of propulsion, with their fins acting as rudders. This is supported by George Lauder, a notable researcher of the biomechanics and evolutionary biology of fish, as well as their hydrodynamics, giving credence to what the paper has suggested. So, it seems as if Spinosaurus in terms of its tail was actually more fish-like than crocodilian, at least from this comparison, although due to differences in phylogeny, body form and size, there is still work to be done to see how well they compare to these aquatic animals. Why Spinosaurus is semi-aquatic to the extent that it is, is also a remarkable example of niche partitioning, which would have been especially important in the case of Spinosaurus, considering the ecosystem where they existed. The Chemchem beds would have been dominated by several large carnivorous animals, including the massive Carcharodontosaurus and Deltadromius, as well as large crocodilomorphs and pterosaurs, in what would have been one of the most dangerous areas in Earth's history. No other terrestrial ecosystem today exhibits such a bias to large-bodied carnivores, and for so many huge carnivores to coexist in an area with a limited diversity of herbivores, they can't have all been preying on the same organisms. So, to avoid the competition on the land, and to take advantage of the abundant supplies of giant fish species, the ancestors of Spinosaurus gradually took to the water, and as a result, would allow these dinosaurs to thrive amongst an ecosystem dominated by other giant carnivores. As new discoveries are made, the fragmentary and up until rather recently, largely forgotten Spinosaurus has gradually been pieced back together. From a sail-backed generic theropod, to a massive crested terror, and now an unusual theropod most comfortable in the water, utilising its large, paddle-like tail to allow it to traverse its aquatic environment to take advantage of the plentiful fish species that called North Africa home, taking its anatomy to lengths that we have as of yet never seen before in any other non-avian dinosaur. 
Ibrahim and his team also seek to study how webbed the feet may have been, including how far they could spread, and therefore how well they could assist Spinosaurus in moving through the water. The team may also go back to the dig site to find the arms of the animal, which could then reveal even more about these remarkable animals, and these future expeditions are certainly not out of the question. Whatever the case, new discoveries and research will surely reveal more about the tail and other anatomy of these remarkable animals, and this is definitely not the last time we have heard from the truly bizarre dinosaur that is Spinosaurus. And with that, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.